Thank you for being here today. Thank you, Ricky G. Perfect. You ready for the word today? All right, three of you ready. Hopefully the rest will get ready before we get on into this. Today I'm going to wrap up this uh, sermon series, Asking for a Friend, as we talk about some of these tough questions. And I'm going to hit several tough questions today. But uh, we've probably all been in those situations and circumstances where uh, an awkward question was asked. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody, and they said, you look familiar. Do I, do I know you from somewhere? And I said, well, you ever been to prison? Most of the time, my humor falls short. And when the look on their face became very somber and almost ashamed, they said, well, that was another time in my life. Yeah, that didn't go quite the way I wanted it to go. Uh, some questions just make life awkward. But uh, some of these questions, they're just tough questions, but we're going to see what God's Word has to say about these questions. And uh, because we are people of the Word. Can I get an amen? All right, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Probably the most popular verse in the Bible. But it expresses the love of God. And that's one thing you will hear about here in the beginning and at the very end, the love of God. God loves you. Look at your neighbor and say, God loves you. He loves you. It doesn't matter what you look like. doesn't matter where you've been. God loves you, period. Uh, so the question when it comes down to God's love, the first question is this, you know, how can a loving God, God is so loving, how can a loving God send people to hell? Well, the answer to the question is, in short, is simple. God doesn't send anyone to hell. Sin does. Sin is what sends people to hell. God sent his son to a cross so that we wouldn't have to go to hell. But let me explain like this. What if, what if you knocked on the door of the most expensive house in Dallas, you knocked on that door, the owners answered, and you said, hey, I'm moving in with you. What do you think would happen? They called police, right? Yeah. Security, or slam the door in your face. Yeah, you're not getting in. Why? Uh, people question God's fairness in the same way. We, we wouldn't expect them to let us in because we have no relationship with them. People question God's fairness and uh, spend their entire lives having nothing to do with God, wanting to live life their own way, but at the end of their life say, hey, I'm moving in with you, God. Uh, and we kind of have this expectation, well, God should, yeah, surely let everybody in because he's loving. But the fact that he gives us a choice to be in relationship with him proves that God's loving. And, and not everybody wants to go to heaven. Why would they want to go? People who have rejected God all their life, but at the end of their life, uh, want to spend eternity with the God that they couldn't spend a short lifetime here with? I don't know. John 1, 12 says this, to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. God wants a relationship with every single one of us. He wants us to be in the family of God. Here's a second question. Why did God create humans if he knew they would go to hell? Well, the fact is, God created us, and you'll hear this a lot. God created us for relationship. Everybody say relationship. God created us for relationship. In Genesis 1, he said, let us make man in our image. But I want you to notice the difference between when God made man and when God made nature. Uh, Genesis 1, 3 says, let there be light. There was light. When God spoke the worlds into existence, they came into existence through the spoken word. But when he created mankind, when he created us, it says, Genesis 2, 7, he formed a man from the dust. He touched us because he came close to us. He brought us into relationship and he formed us. He hasn't forced us, he has formed us. And he's given us all the free will to choose to follow him and to be in relationship with him. But what, what if somebody was the victim of a terrible dysfunctional family and experienced abuse and neglect and rape or incest their heart was hard their heart was cold 
and they wanted nothing to do with God their entire life. Someone comes to them on their deathbed, invites them to accept Jesus. Are you telling me that that person's going to spend eternity in hell? I would say no, but the presumption is that everybody wants to go to heaven. And not everyone wants to go to heaven. Some have been running from God their entire life. And what God's not going to do at the end of your life is come to you and say, I know you've been running from me your whole life, but now I'm forcing you to come to heaven with me. Now, it's a free will choice. And God didn't create hell for any of us. God, hell is not created for you. Hell's not created for me. The Bible tells us that hell was created for the devil and his angels. Uh, Psalms 25, 11. That's what hell is created for. In fact, the, the whole topic of hell, I know, becomes an issue with a lot of people. It seems like there's more and more people just, they don't believe in a hell. They believe in a heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to believe in a hell. And I know that there are some references to hell in the Bible that are metaphoric, but some are very literal. But does the crime really fit the punishment? I mean, you know, for people, we haven't murdered anybody. We haven't, we haven't avoided paying our taxes. We, we, we try to be good people. Really, eterna, eternity in hell, in fire. Uh, here's what we do know. We do know that hell is separation from God. That's what hell is. But hell is not Satan's headquarters. I know this may confuse some. The devil doesn't live in hell. In fact, he's never been there. He will be cast into hell, into the lake of fire in the future, but he's not there now. He's not planning his next attack from hell. In fact, I'll blow your minds. He doesn't wear red spandex and have a pitchfork either. The Bible says he was an angel. When he spread his wings, heaven sang. I mean, when God spoke to Satan in the book of Job and said, where have you been? He said, I've been roaming the earth. Roaming the earth. What does he do? Looking for whom he may devour. So I know that there are degrees of punishment in hell and there are degrees of reward in heaven. But the Bible doesn't say that, uh, which some confuse, that we'll be tortured forever in hell. The word torture is not there. The word torment is there. But torment is more of an internal punishment. It's more of an internal uh, affliction. It's, it's something that we feel inside because of mistakes that we have made. It's a, it's a deep regret and remorse. But the Bible also refers to weeping and gnashing of teeth. That Yes, there will be weeping because of loss. Gnashing is a word for anger, and it's more of the word anger in regret rather than repentance. It's like what happens when you get pulled over and uh, get a ticket for speeding. And if you're repentant, you'll start driving the speed limit. But if you just regret that you got pulled over, you're going to go by a radar detector. That's what you're going to do. Because we're not sorry we got caught. We're just going to find a way to not get caught again. Now, I would never encourage that for you policemen that are here. But at the end of the day, listen, ultimately, hell is separation from God. And if God is anything, God is fair and God is just. In fact, he's so fair and so just that he was willing to send his son to die on the cross for our sins, sins that we committed. He paid for them for us. And if he's fair in this life, he will be fair in the afterlife. But number three, isn't, isn't everybody children of God? I mean, aren't we all children of God? Well, unfortunately, no. Galatians 3.26 says, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So if you put your faith in Christ, you become a son and a daughter of God. But Jesus actually called some people in John 8, 44, he says, you are the children of your father, the devil. Well, why would he say that to some people? He said that because they had refused to make room in their heart for his message. Just a few verses earlier in John 8, 37, he said, I realize that you're descendants of Abraham, yet some of you are trying to kill me because there's no room in your hearts for my message. Now, using the same illustration that I used just a moment ago, if a stranger came to you, let's say he walked up to your house, knocked on the door of your house, and said, hey, I'm moving in with you. Would it be fair for me to call you mean or unfair for not letting them in? No. Would you be unloving? No. Because them moving in with you is not based upon a question of whether or not you're loving 
or whether or not you're fair. It's based upon your relationship with the person. God has invited every single one of us into a loving relationship with him. And it's up to us to make that choice, to choose to follow him. In fact, he has put all kinds of uh, precautions in place to keep us from making the wrong decision of doing life our way. He's given us his word. He's given us a roadmap to eternal life through his word. He's given us friends who will encourage us and speak life. He's given us a church to teach us the truth. He's given us his Holy Spirit that convicts us and guides us and comforts us. So let me explain it like this. What if I invited you over my house? We're gonna invite a lot of people to our house in these stories today, okay? Let's say I invited you to my house and I said, man, you've got free reign of the whole house. You got refrigerator rights. You want something out of the refrigerator? Just go get it. Don't ask, just go. But there is one room I don't want you to go in. If you go into the garage, there's a steel door in that garage. Don't open that door because if you do, there's a lion in there and that lion will kill you. Okay, I've expressed my will, right? My will is that you don't open that door and die from the lion. And, and just to make sure you don't die, I've also put a big red sign, beware, lion inside, will kill you if you open this door. I even put red flashing lights on the door because I don't want you to miss that this is the door, that if you open that door, you will die. I even put a padlock on the door. Have I made my will known? Have I made my will clear? My will is for you to live and not die. But you have a choice. And what if you chose and you found my keys and you went to that door and you unlocked that padlock and you ignored the big red flashing lights and the sign that said, don't open this door or you will die. And you opened the big metal door and the lion killed you. Here's the question. Did I send you to your death? No, I didn't send you to your death. You made a choice, a real bad choice. And that's what cost you your life. It's the same with us in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Bible tells us that God is patient with us. He's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And he's put roadblocks up to try to keep us from making choices that would end our life, that would bring spiritual death. So we've got to make those right choices. But by Kindle, don't all roads lead to God anyway? I mean, if we're just good, if we're just good people, aren't all roads going to take us to God? Well, let us... That perhaps you invite me over to your house for dinner and you tell me, hey, to get to my house, you're going to go out of the church here. You're going to go east on Hebron. You're going to go to the North Dallas Tollway, go north. You're going to exit Parker, turn right, go down to the first light and uh, turn left and go. Up. I'm, my house is about five houses down on the right. And what if I said to you, yeah, I don't like going north on the tollway. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out here. I'm going to go south on the tollway. I'm going to go down to Luke 12, and I'm going to go right on Luke 12, and then I'll go to the first light. Then I'll turn left, and I'll go to the fifth house on the right, and I'll meet you there. You would think I'm crazy, right? That's not going to get me to your house. But I believe all roads lead to your house. See, yeah, that's not the same. That's not the same. But yes, it is. The fact is, Many people think that all roads lead to the same place, but that's just not true. The roads happen to lead through Jesus Christ, and that's why Jesus told us in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if we're not careful, we can tend to buy into this culture that we live in today that says all roads do lead to God, and if you're just a good person, you're going to get there. Uh, don't buy that lie. Follow Jesus. But Kendall, isn't it narrow-minded to think that Christianity is the only way? Isn't that kind of narrow-minded? There's another word that I would use rather than narrow-minded. You know the word I would use? Specific. It's not narrow-minded, but it is very specific. 
Jesus said in Luke eleven thirty five, 35, make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. Because there are some people that have grown up with beliefs that they, they just, they were raised with, they never questioned. But that belief may not be leading you in the place that you want to go. Because if we could all be good and do whatever we want and still be good enough to be accepted, then why did Jesus have to suffer and why did Jesus have to die? Why did he have to come if we can make it on our, on our own? And if we could make it on our own, then we don't need Jesus. The truth is, most people just don't like being told that there's only one way. But suppose you had a terminal illness. And you were told that at this time, there's no cure for your terminal illness. But you happen to come along a doctor, and a doctor said, I found the cure. I've got the cure. It's the only cure available, but it is proven it will cure your terminal illness. And what if you said to that doctor, yeah, I just don't like the fact that there's only one cure. I think I'd like to wait until I have options. Well, that'd be very foolish. But that's kind of the way it is with some people who don't like the fact that Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You want options. Well, not all those options are going to lead you to the place that you want to go. 1 John 5, 12 says, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have God's life. And again, John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Did you know that when the Titanic went down, that uh, there was a message board that was put up in Liverpool, England. On the message board, it had a list, a category, known to be saved, and another category, known to be lost. Two categories, those who were known to be saved and those who were known to be lost. Now, on the ship itself, people were classified differently. There was first-class passengers. There were second-class passengers. There were third-class passengers. There were people who, I mean, come on, we all saw Titanic. There are people down there on the bottom of this. They're partying down there, right? Some stowaways. But at the end of the day, there's only two categories. Those known to be saved and those known to be lost. In fact, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, the message of the cross, it's foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it's the power of God. Notice two categories. Those headed for destruction are those being saved. But Kendall, come on, what makes Christianity unique? I mean, you say this is, this is, Jesus is the way. What makes this different than the other religions of the world? And I'll take you back to relationship. Christianity is about a relationship, a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, Billy Graham said this, most of the world's religions are based upon philosophical thought, except for Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. And he said, of those four major religions, those four are based upon personalities. Yahweh, Buddha, Muhammad, and Jesus. But only Christianity claims resurrection from the dead for its founder. And that claim is proven and that claim is true. Christianity is the only religion that has solved this, the issue of sin. Because every single one of us in this room, we've all lied at some point. You've probably stolen something at some point. If you've had anger or hatred in your heart towards somebody, according to Jesus, same as murder. You've looked at somebody with lust in your heart, same as adultery. Some of you may be taking the Lord's name in vain. That's just five of the Ten Commandments. We won't go any further than that. We're all sinners. We've all messed up. We've all fallen short. But it's sin that sends people to hell. And the only way that we can stay out of hell is if we appear perfect before God on Judgment Day. And the only way that that's humanly possible is for us to accept Jesus Christ, to accept the fact that he came to this earth, lived a perfect life, took on the punishment of our sins by dying on the cross, and no religion on the, on the planet has offered a solution for the sin problem except for Christianity. In fact, Galatians 1.4 says, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. It's 
Psalms 86, 5 says, Lord, you're good, so ready to forgive, so full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. It's as simple as this, admitting that we're sinners, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and confessing him as your Lord. Let me wrap it up with this. Jesus told a story when he tried to express the the truth of God's love. And most of us, we hear one message of the story, but, but what Jesus was really trying to explain through this story was just how much God loves you. And he told the story of a father who had two sons. One son, the younger son, decided he was done with working there on the farm with his father. So he came to his father and he said, Dad, if you were to die, I would get an inheritance. So I'd like to ask for my inheritance right now. And I want to go on my own. I want to live my own life. I want to do my own thing. I'm tired of being here. Basically, what he was saying is, Dad, I wish you were dead. It's how hard and how cold he was. But the love of the father, the father said, I'll give you your share of the inheritance. He took his share of the inheritance and he went out into the world and he wasted all the money, parting, spending on booze, spending on girls, so he's just wild living until he finally was out of money. And when he was out of money, he was out of friends because as long as he was paying for the party, he had plenty of friends. But when the money ran out, so did the friends. He finds himself broken without anything and the only job that he could find is feeding pigs a pig farm. He's in the middle of that pig farm and realizes he has hit the bottom. That's when he realizes that the hired servants who work for his father live better than he does. So he overcame his shame and his guilt and he got up and he decided, I'm going to make my way back home and I'm going to ask my father if he will at least let me back in as a hired hand. So he starts working on this speech that he's going to give. But what he didn't understand is the love of the Father. For every day since his son had left, the Father had prayed for his son's return. The Father had hoped against hope, and every day he even looked down the road and wished that he would see his son walking down that road, and finally that day came. The Father's standing on the porch of his house, and he looks out and he sees the silhouette of a figure, and he thinks, could this be the day? As he got a little closer, the sun started to illuminate features of his face, and he realized, that's my son. And the father did something unexpected. He did something undignified. Pulled up his robe, and he began to run, which fathers didn't do in that culture. But he started running towards his father, I mean, towards his son. And he got to his son, and he wrapped his arms around his son, and the son started in on his speech, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. But if you'll just let me be your hired hand. I, and he said, I'll hear nothing of that. And he hugged him again and muffled his voice in a big, strong embrace. Then he said, let's throw a party. My son who was lost has now been found. Let's put a new robe on his back and shoes on his feet and a ring on his finger. Kill that calf and let's have a party. That's a picture of God's love for us. Nothing that boy did was deserving of the father's love. He had thrown it away. He had trashed it. But yet the father still loved the son. It was unearned. It was unmerited. But that's not where the story ends. Because while the party is being put together, the older son walks up to the dad and says, what is going on? Dad says, your brother, my son, has come home. He was lost, but now he's found. We're celebrating the fact that he's back. You know what the older brother said? I can't believe you're throwing a party for that loser. I've been here. I've been faithful. I've served you. I've been obedient. I've done what you asked me to do. I deserve the party. I've worked for it. 
That's the difference between a relationship and religion. Relationship is based on God's love for you, which is unconditional. There's nothing you could do to make him love you less. Religion says, I've earned it. I've worked for it. I've kept all the commandments. I paid my tithes. I showed up at church. I loved people. I went to the jail and visited people in the jail. I fed the homeless. I've loved everybody. I've done my part, God. I earned this. You know what? There's nothing you could do to make God love you more. And there's nothing you could do to make God love you less. If you think what you do makes God love you more, stop it because you can't. If you think what you've done in the past has made God love you less, stop it. Because nothing you've done changes the love of God. He loves you, period. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to know that love today. He wants you to experience that love today. It's available for each and every one of us.